The aerial struggle in the skies of southern England during the summer of 1940, now immortalized in the nation's history as the Battle of Britain, was primarily a triumph for the Royal Air Force's Fighter Command. In its four months duration, a total of 3,080 pilots, for the most part young eager men, fought a daily contest of wits, skill, and matchless courage with an equally skilled, determined opponent, the Luftwaffe. For the Germans, it was simply another stage in their fanatical leader's grandiose plan of world domination. For the RAF, the conflict was a desperate defense of its homeland and heritage. The self-sacrifice and astounding prowess of the fighter pilots, the few, as Churchill called them, earned undying fame and deservedly so. With the army only slowly recovering from the Battle of France, and the traditional first line defense of the Royal Navy powerless to turn back any air armada, the only offensive weapon available to Britain was the relatively small force of the RAF's Bomber Command. While Air Marshal Dowding's fighter command flung themselves daily against seemingly impossible odds in the skies, the bomber crews hit back each night, battering the ports in France and Holland, which could possibly be used for the projected German invasion. These raids gave the German population a foretaste of the meaning of total war. Elsewhere, the RAF's coastal command crews continued their vital task of protecting the merchant shipping supplying Britain's vital war materials and food. On the ground, the men and women of the balloon barrage, radar stations and sector control rooms played their vital parts. Meanwhile, the airmen and airwomen of the servicing crews worked without pause, providing a truly magnificent backup for the exhausted fighter pilots. Indeed, without this unceasing backup, ground maintenance, the fighters' eventual triumph would not have been possible. By June 1940, the remnants of the RAF in France had found their way back to England. At Fighter Command headquarters at Bentley Priory, Air Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding was already preparing for the inevitable aerial onslaught against Britain by the Luftwaffe. His task appeared hopeless. The German war machine now occupied countries in a semicircle around Britain's east and south coasts, stretching from Norway to Western France. Intelligence reports indicated that the Luftwaffe's operational strength was well over 2,000 aircraft, 60% of which were bombers.
Dowding could produce no more than 1,200 trained pilots and 800 aircraft, of which only 600 were considered frontline machines. Fighter production was already receiving priority, and factories throughout the land were engaged in manufacturing the much needed aircraft. The trained pilots were in desperately short supply. At the very heart of the command's defence system was the network of radar detection stations spread thinly across southern and eastern coasts. These stations gave vital warning of any aircraft approaching Britain's shores. Each was linked to the command group and sector controllers who were in direct control with the fighter squadrons both on the ground and in the air. Operations against England were started by the Luftwaffe on the night of June the 5th, a modest bombing raid against airfields near the east coast. By late June, the attacks became more intensive with a series of daylight raids on Allied merchant shipping in the English Channel. Fighter command was forced to retaliate in some strength. The consequent clashes gave the Luftwaffe its first inkling of the fierce defence they were to encounter during the coming months. Flying over 600 sorties a day, the RAF fighter squadrons became accustomed to the daunting sight of layer upon layer of black-crossed opponents in awesome array. The outnumbering odds facing the fighter pilots had never been faced before in the history of air warfare. On June the 30th, Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, issued general directions for air operations against England. The destruction of the RAF was given prime consideration in the directives. On July the 11th, he gave specific orders for attacks on the Channel convoys in an attempt to draw out the RAF's fighters, thus testing Dowding's air defences and forcing him to use up his precious reserves. RAF fighter tactics left much to be desired at the stage. Squadrons flew in sections of three, a leader and two wing men. The problem was that although the leader was free to scan the sky for hostile aircraft, his two wing men were kept busy watching their leader, making sure they didn't collide with him. This rigid, inflexible formation took some time to change, and even when some of the more discerning air fighters and leaders began to adopt a more open formation with sections of four rather than three, there was no immediate directive from Fighter Command HQ. Fortunately, some of the more experienced air fighters quickly proved that the new formation gave them more flexibility. Men whose names would soon emerge to be well known in the RAF and to the British public. Sailor Milan, Douglas Bader, 
Al dear. Bob Tuck and Ginger Lacey. The resulting battles over the coastal convoys were vicious and costly to both sides. Several young and inexperienced pilots were lost chancing their arm against the Luftwaffe, some chasing Germans back to France, only to be jumped by Messerschmitt 109s over the sea. The strain on the young Spitfire and Hurricane pilots mounted swiftly, with physical and nervous parameters being reached within weeks of such continuous combat. The telephone became the centre of attention in all of the crew rooms, dispersal huts and pilots' caravans. The pilots would try to ignore its presence, but as soon as it rang, their hearts missed a beat. Its message could send them off once again, racing to their waiting fighters. As the battle mounted, the constant flying and ferocious fighting at high altitude began to sap the pilots' energy. The RAF's favour was the fact that they were fighting above their homeland. If they had to abandon their aircraft, they could quickly be retrieved. The psychological reaction to this knowledge was some comfort to the hard-pressed fighter pilots. The arrival of a rescue launch to pick up an unfortunate airman in distress became a familiar and welcome sight around the shores of the English coastline. During this stage of the battle, Dowding had wisely refused to commit the squadrons protecting the north of England. Instead, he used these backwater units as turnaround replacements for combat-weary and depleted squadrons. The pilots were given a much-needed rest, and the squadrons had a chance to recuperate and replenish aircraft and personnel. This system prevailed throughout the battle. By the beginning of August, the Luftwaffe had lost over 220 aircraft, against the RAF's losses of less than 100. Not accounting for the many German bombers which had managed to return to their French bases, irreparably damaged with dead or seriously wounded crews. What these figures revealed was the determination, skill and valor of the fighter pilots in tackling overwhelming odds and winning the battles of attrition in the air. Principal targets for the Luftwaffe had been the RAF fighter bases and the early warning stations in the south of England. Although most airfields received raids, a great deal of effort on the part of the Luftwaffe was dispelled on minor, relatively unimportant targets, revealing that the Luftwaffe's intelligence service was lacking in precise information as to which airfields were the key fighter bases in Britain's front line of defence. Most of the attacks on the airfields were, although by no means slight, not severe enough to render them out of action for much more than a day. The undefeatable ground crews would work round the clock to get them cleared of debris and repaired. The second phase of the battle began on the 8th of August. The enemy now saw their task as mainly a fighter versus fighter conflict in order to destroy the British fighter command. The bombers, which were now attacking mainly airfields, provided the bait to bring the Hurricanes and Spitfires to battle. Then the 109 pilots could deal with them. At the start of this period, there appeared a lull in Luftwaffe activity, and it was clear to Dowding that this had to mean that the enemy was regrouping for an all-out assault. 
Every pilot in fighter command had little doubt that the destiny of Britain lay in their hands. Train pilots were now coming in at a steady speed, making up for the recent losses. Dowding now had over 1,400 pilots, his dilemma being that they lacked experience. Nearly 100 experienced regular squadron and flight commanders had been lost since the May of that year. Hermann Goering had promised Hitler that his Luftwaffe would have cleared the sky of the RAF in readiness for the intended invasion during early August. His air force, the mightiest air force in the world at that time, was now building up its strength in preparation. Some 2,250 aircraft were ready and waiting between Cherbourg and Norway. Against this, Dowding had just over 700, an increase in the number he had started the battle with, owing to the tremendous effort by the aircraft factory workers. When the inevitable assault came, the RAF's fighter command were as ready as they could be. Day after day, the Luftwaffe poured across the channel in huge formations and locked horns with the RAF. Each time, the pilots of fighter command were ready for it. On one day alone, 484 bombers and over 1,000 fighters crossed the English coast. The RAF shot down 34 of them. Dozens of others were slashed and semi-crippled by the Spitfires and Hurricanes and sent staggering back to France. Witnesses of the continuing potency of the RAF Fighter Command. stations were on constant alert. Readiness was always at dawn. On a scramble, it was known for some pilots to dash to their aircraft in their pajamas. Takeoffs from the grass airstrips were usually in squadron strength for four sections of three aircraft, each lifting off one after the other, and sometimes over each other, only minutes after the scramble. Each unit climbed flat out with full throttle, and each individual squadron climbed to engage the enemy as one unit but hoped that somewhere nearby would be another squadron of 12 aircraft. The pilots had very little else to think about other than to climb hard and get stuck into the journey. Many times there would be just 12 aircraft battling against 100 or more enemy aircraft. The pilots lived every day from dawn readiness, which was about 3.30 a.m., until they were released at dusk. Each new day might very well be their last. But it wasn't just the pilots' day that started early. If the pilots were ready by dawn, the ground crews had been up earlier, testing the engines and running them up. The flight sergeant's duty was to endeavor, wherever possible, to have the aircraft ready for action following the previous day's battle damage. Towards the end of August, Goering directed all future raids were to be concentrated solely on the destruction of fighter command, their airfields, their aircraft, and their factories. He also made a major error in ordering the ceasing of attacks against the chain of radar stations, completely ignorant of their importance. For the remainder of August, the RAF's fighter stations suffered heavily. 
Particularly badly hit, though typical of many other bases, were Hornchurch and Biggin Hill, which suffered devastating, accurate raids on August the 31st. On this particular attack, the airfield looked like a slaughterhouse, with over 60 personnel killed and many more wounded. Dazed and shocked, the airmen and airwomen of Biggin Hill quickly retrieved what they could from the wreckage and almost immediately set up a temporary operations room in a nearby village shop, thus enabling one squadron to remain operational. This, amongst all of the other carnage at stations around the southeast of England, showed the sheer tenacity and unbroken spirit of Dowding's few. The grim pace of the endless fighting, however, was taking a stark toll on the strength of fighter command. In the 14 days from August the 24th until September the 6th, they had lost 466 Spitfires and Hurricanes, which were either ridden off or in a desperate need of major repair. 103 pilots had been killed, whilst another 128 were seriously wounded. Utterly exhausted and desperately depleted squadrons were being continually rotated with ostensibly fresh squadrons from the north. But the limits of human endurance were fast approaching. Then came a turning point in the battle. Fortuitously for Dowding, Göring, having been given a free hand by Hitler, ordered a complete switch in tactical objectives. From September the 7th, all attacks were to be channeled into bombing London by day and night, which the Germans hoped would cause the morale of the British people to crack. This new directive was to give fighter command a new measure of relief, with time to regroup and rearm. Although it was only to give a modicum of relief for the pilots, who were soon to be called upon to defend the very heart of the British Empire. However, totally unaware of this new directive and prepared for attacks on its airfields, the RAF were not even considering a raid on London when the radar screen showed a massive armada of aircraft heading towards the Thames estuary. 300 bombers escorted by 600 fighters in two waves. The first wave flew direct to the estuary. The other passed over central London before turning back to the estuary and the east of London. Caught totally unawares, the RAF had no time to engage the enemy before many of the German bombers had dropped their bombs. So whilst the airfields were safely defended, the road to London was open. The city had been hit hard. Over 450 civilians were left dead and over 1,300 were wounded. The new phase in Hitler's offensive against Britain had begun. London and its populace would now have to take it. For the next seven days, the Luftwaffe raided London by day and night, and the pilots of fighter command fought back hard and furious. Prompted by poor German intelligence, the Luftwaffe was under the misbelief that fighter command was virtually by now a non-effective force. On September the 15th, the air struggle reached its peak and this illusion was cruelly shattered. Throughout the day, the Luftwaffe dispatched hundreds of bombers in wave after wave, protected above by hundreds of 109s, all heading for London. The RAF fighter pilots threw themselves relentlessly at the vast hordes of Black Cross bombers. The sheer numbers of fighters must have come as a great shock to the pilots and crew of the Luftwaffe, confident that the RAF was now down to a mere handful. Yet all they could see was squadron after squadron, flight after flight of Spitfires and Hurricanes heading straight for them 
wing guns blazing. But for the RAF, these 300 fighters were all they had. There were very few reserves, and they were outnumbered five to one. From London to the Channel was a constant battle scene. The RAF and their opponents weaving fantastic contrail patterns in the blue skies. No German formation remained unmolested. Few German aircraft remained unscathed. The Hurricanes and Spitfires hacked the German formations to shreds and took a bloody toll. Sadly, 26 RAF pilots were lost, but three times that number of aircraft were lost by the Luftwaffe, dealing them a savage blow. This day was undeniably the greatest single day in the history of fighter command. Winston Churchill, in one of his speeches to the nation, immortalized Dowding's brave pilots forever when he said, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. By November 1940, the severely mauled Luftwaffe, struggling in daylight raids, turned to night bombing. Dowding, chief architect of the fighter command's victory, was replaced as commander-in-chief by Air Marshal Sir William Sholto Douglas. The brilliant 11 Group Commander Keith Park, whose tactics had virtually assured the victory, was replaced by Lee Mallory, the former 12 Group Chief. This was a period in which the aims of fighter command were about to shift. As the German night blitz on the British cities got underway, so did the creation of fresh problems for the fighters. For now, they had to seek out the enemy, operating in a cloak of darkness. Possessing no aircraft specifically designed or equipped for such a task, fighter command had to improvise, employing day fighters in a role for which they were never envisaged. Scholtel Douglas had different ideas to Dowdy. He was an exponent of the offensive, and his principal aim was to begin this phase of the war by using his fighters to start attacking into Europe. Such a policy had two main objectives. One, to cause the Luftwaffe to maintain a defensive force chained down in France. And secondly, to give the RAF fighter pilots an offensive initiative, both in practice and morale. The beginning of this fresh policy came on December the 20th, 1940 when two Spitfires crossed the channel and attacked the airfield at Lutuque. Although they only damaged two grounded aircraft and some buildings, this was the start of an ever-increasing offensive for fighter command. In January 1941, a new tactic was inaugurated, Circus One. Using a single Blenheim bomber unit, Escorted by no less than nine fighter squadrons, the circus had a single aim. To force the German fighters into the air in circumstances which favored the RAF fighters. The initial raids were successful due to the unreadiness of the Luftwaffe for such attacks. The circus operations continued throughout the first half of 1941. Massive fighter sweeps, using bombers as a bait to bring up the German fighters forcing the Luftwaffe into battle on RAF terms. This 
This new offensive gave invaluable experience to the fresh fighter pilots commencing their operational careers and gave birth to new variations in fighter tactics and means of leadership within fighter command. Whereas previously the RAF fighters had been operating in tight formations of three or four, harsh experience approved the ineffectiveness of such flying. The RAF pilots were now directed to fly in pairs, the leader being closely protected by the wingman. Two such pairs would fly in formation, thus creating a new fighting unit. The number one became the fighting killing partner, whilst the number two protected the leader's tail and fended off opposition. Another new initiative, one that had been perfected during the Battle of Britain, was that four or more squadrons would be based on one airfield as a wing led by a wing commander. Douglas Bader and Sailor Milan had been the initial wing leaders and had set a standard which the RAF was to continue through the subsequent years. By the summer of 1941, with the main forces of the Germans now aimed at defeating Russia, the nightly blitz on Britain had eased greatly. In just over a year, they had achieved considerable success in terms of destruction of property and civilian casualties. In opposition, the RAF had fought a long and frustrating campaign in the night skies. RAF night fighters, per se, simply did not exist. Instead, there were a number of hastily improvised conversions. Converted Blenheim bombers, Defiance, Hurricanes and a few Spitfires, plus a variety of second-line machines had been pressed into service. These fighters continued to grope helplessly in the night air, seeing very little and gaining few victories. However, improvements were rapidly being made in the development of radar. In particular, the A1 Mark IV, which was being fitted to Blenheim Mark IV and the newly issued Bowfighters. Gradually, night victories began to increase as the crews became familiar with the new machines and new radar. Such results were the culmination during this period of months of patient trial and error, demanding the utmost skill and resolution from fighter crews. Fighter command was now rapidly increasing in strength. The day fighters were still predominantly Spitfires and Hurricanes, but these machines were vastly improved versions on those that had won the 1940 battles. Machine guns had given way to cannon power and their Merlin engines had been uprated. The Hurricanes were now relegated to low-level attacks, often fitted externally with bombs. From the Hawker stable came a new aircraft, the Typhoon. Fitted with four cannons, this brutish-looking aircraft with a high load carrying capability, high speed, and ability to absorb a great deal of battle damage proved to be a tough war horse. However, the main onus of responsibility of our fighting remained with the Spitfire, which was being continuously modified and embellished. By Christmas 1941, Fighter Command had 100 frontline squadrons available for operation. While the day fighters continued to mount mini armadas in offensive sweeps across France, battling with the Luftwaffe in sprawling, sudden death combat, the night fighters of fighter command continued to expand their efficiency and methods. To the bow fighters and havocs already in service were added the new de Havilland Mosquito. This classic all-wooden machine with its astonishing speed, 
maneuverability and heavy fighter armament proved ideal for the night fighting role and was used to undertake a new offensive of intruding over enemy airfields by night. Equipped with a crew of two, the Mosquito quickly established a high record of achievement, roaming the continental airfields and creating havoc wherever it struck. The high peak of day fighting activity in 1942 for fighter command was reached in August when a mainly Canadian land force was dispatched on a probing attempt to land on French soil at Dieppe. This was predominantly a rehearsal for the ultimate invasion of occupied Europe. This operation provided fighter command with a practical opportunity to test Luftwaffe opposition over any Allied beachhead. A total of 56 squadrons of Spitfires, Typhoons and Hurricanes were detailed to provide an umbrella over the barge-filled invasion fleet. They were complemented by a further nine squadrons of Mustangs, Blenheims and Bostons, which were to provide reconnaissance, smoke screens and tactical support to the troops. High above the invasion fleet in the blue skies, the wheeling Spitfires were soon engaged by hordes of Luftwaffe fighters and a continuous battle waged for the next few hours. As the fighters exhausted their fuel and ammunition and swung out of the battle to return to base, reinforcements took their places and continued to thwart the many hundreds of Luftwaffe bombers attempting to interfere with the land invasion. Air combat was fierce and the combat zone became a box of sky, several miles wide and layered from zero level to 30,000 feet. A flashing, wheeling, tracer crossed three-dimensional cube of intense life or death endeavor. By 1400 hours, the planned withdrawal of the heavily mauled ground troops was completed. But the Luftwaffe continued to harass the returning landing craft well into the afternoon. As the bright sun finally set that evening, Fighter Command had lost over 100 aircraft in the bloody conflict, but had claimed 91 German aircraft destroyed and a further 190 possibly destroyed or seriously damaged. Although losses had been high, the fact was now proved that an aerial umbrella would be almost entirely successful in stopping the enemy during a land invasion. And this fact encouraged the Allied war chiefs in their forward planning. There was another great turning point for fighter command during this period. The Spitfires were now being successfully used to escort the new American B-17 bombers on their first sorties. These initial raids were the trailblazers for the mighty formations which were to devastate the heartlands of Germany for the rest of the war. In November 1942, Command of the RAF's fighters was passed to Trafford Lee Mallory. The strength of the command had now risen to over a hundred frontline squadrons, which were continuing to hack away at the Luftwaffe across the channel. There were new airfields and specialist training units, and the basic command structure had been greatly expanded. In the summer and autumn of 1943, the Spitfires overlapped with the United States Air Force's Mustangs and Thunderbolts in providing thick cover for the ever-increasing stream of American heavy bombers, pounding targets further and further into Germany. The daylight raids on the Luftwaffe kept constant pressure on the German fighter arm. 
equally depleting on the Luftwaffe's strength, with the constant low-level strafing sweeps undertaken by the British and Allied fighters. Zero height surprise assaults, which left a trail of burning and broken machines, men and buildings in their wake. Yet the German air arm was far from defeated. There were huge numbers of replacements from the German factories. Behind the scenes, while the daily fighting continued in the blue arena over France, Plans were already underway for the long-awaited return to Europe by the Allied armies. With the target date set for the early summer of 1944, the invasion forces were slowly being assembled and prepared. The prime need to establish air supremacy over the Luftwaffe in France led to a complete reorganization of fighter command. Number two, Group Bomber Command, consisting of all the existing light and medium day bombers, was put under the leadership of fighter command. By the beginning of 1944, fighter command as such was dissolved, and its place was taken by two new formations the second tactical air force and the revived air defense of Great Britain. All but air defense came under the command of the recently formed Allied Expeditionary Air Force, commanded by Lee Mallory, which included the US 9th Air Force. Thereafter, the former 12 Group Commander, Air Marshal Roderick Hill, was appointed as Commander-in-Chief of the Air Defense of Great Britain. With an operational strength of only 10 day and 11 night fighter squadrons with which to defend the United Kingdom. He continued to provide offensive sorties across the Channel and was also responsible for the operational training of the fighter forces, building up a reserve for the coming year's battles. There were large demands made on this small force which became even more demanding when the Luftwaffe reopened their nightly assaults on the UK. The first of these heavy assaults came in January 1944, when 447 German bombers attacked London. But due to many problems, the raid was unsuccessful. By April of this year, the Luftwaffe lost over 200 aircraft in such raids, a loss they could ill afford. Their bomber crews had been harried from takeoff to final landing, first by the mosquito intruders over their own flare paths, and then by the night fighters waiting to pounce once they had crossed the channel. In addition to which, anti-aircraft guns, searchlights, and many other ingenious countermeasures added sorely to their problems. This bomber offensive proved to be the final assault made by the Luftwaffe against England. As D-Day approached, Roderick Hill's responsibility grew heavier still. Air defense to destroy any German air reconnaissance was crucial over the huge array of land and sea forces assembling in the south of England. This was covered by a constant patrol of high and low level fighter sweeps across the whole area and this vigil was continuously kept up until the actual invasion date. This ploy was completely successful in that 125 reconnaissance sorties were attempted by the Germans in that six-week period. Virtually none of them were permitted to cross the English Channel. Those that did 
were destroyed on the return journey. The fighters continue to keep up a constant rain of bombs and rockets on the whole stretch of radar posts along the French shoreline. Until by dusk on June the 5th, when all was ready for the following morning's Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy. The air power assembled for this operation was the greatest ever seen. At the fingertips of Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, the Deputy Supreme Commander of all the forces involved, were over 2,000 British and 1,300 American fighters, a third of the 9,200 aircraft directly involved with the invasion, apart from the heavy strategic bombers which were to play a massive supporting role of their own. Expecting massive Luftwaffe opposition on the day, the fighter commanders were soon relieved of their fears. No opposition was forthcoming. The Luftwaffe in France battered and depleted by the previous year's poundings by the RAF, was completely overwhelmed. Air supremacy belonged totally to the Allied air formations, maintaining constant strong patrols above the tide of invasion shipping, churning its path across the channel. Fighter squadrons were sent in to blast a way forward for the beach-bound infantry. Spitfire and Typhoon pilots pouncing on any German movement blasting it with a storm of rocket and cannon fire and strafing every road showing German troop reinforcements. As night followed day, the night fighters took over the task of constant protection until by June the 10th, a Canadian fighter wing had established itself and was operating from a French beachhead. The first of many fighter units to take over the French landing strips. As direct control of the invasion air cover was transferred to Europe, Hill's Defence Force in England received a new challenge, the V-1 Flying Bomb. Although over the previous months the Allied bombers had destroyed many of the suspected V-1 launching sites, by June nearly 250 had been launched against Britain, 72 of them exploding in the capital. Hill allotted eight-day fighter squadrons and four night fighter squadrons to nullify this latest form of air bombardment. With a speed of over 400 miles per hour, the V-1 was a difficult target for the fighters. Even if they could manage to catch up with the flying bomb, a fighter was likely to suffer from the effects of its target exploding. For the next two months, V1s continued to rain down over England. London alone received the equivalent of 100 tons of high explosive every day. The fighters patrolled around the clock, seeking, chasing and destroying, but the assault continued regardless. One new weapon did, however, take an effect against the V-1s, the RAF's new jet fighter, the Gloucester Meteor. This aircraft, with its astonishing speeds, was the start of a new age for the Air Force of the future. By March 1945, 10,500 V-1s had been launched against Britain, 3,000 of which never managed to cross the channel. Over 2,000 were brought down by balloons and anti-aircraft fire, and a further 1,850 were destroyed by RAF fighters. As the V-1 onslaught had begun to fade in late 1944, an even worse menace was added to the terror blitz, the V-2 rocket. In the early evening of September the 8th, 1944, the first V-2 fell on Chiswick. This latest opponent was impossible to intercept by existing defences. Only by destruction of its launching sites could the V-2 be nullified. 
and accordingly Bomber Command was brought in to obliterate the rocket bases. The fighters assisted by blasting away at every known rocket site within range. While Hill's small force in England fought its battles with the mechanical menace of Hitler's terror weapons, the RAF's fighters with the 2nd Tactical Air Force on the continent made their massive contribution to the gigantic land struggle for the liberation of Europe. Many hundreds of Spitfires, Typhoons and Mustangs were left free to wreak havoc among the German infantry, resisting the Allied breakout from the Normandy beachheads. Once the battle had moved out into the surrounding open country, Allied fighters roamed far and wide ahead of the land forces, attacking all modes of transport and means of communication behind the now crumbling German front. Flying over 1,200 sorties a day, the fighters spread a perpetual reign of destruction and death to everything which moved or retaliated. The chief danger to these pilots was the highly accurate anti-aircraft flak defences. Mobile gun teams which were able to encircle and defend any important objective within a few hours notice and put up a deadly curtain of shells through which any marauding fighter had to penetrate. On April the 30th, in a last ditch attempt by the Luftwaffe, there was a mass air battle resulting in the Allied fighters claiming 37 German fighters destroyed without any Allied loss reported. Even the rare appearance of the new Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter made no impact. Raw courage and determination shown by the German pilots could not compensate for utter and complete inferiority in numbers, reinforcements and lack of overall direction. By May 1945, the Luftwaffe was broken, decimated on the ground and in the air, retaining only the fierce pride and loyalty of a tiny band of dedicated fighter pilots who fought on until the bitter end. That end came on May the 8th, 1945, when Germany signed an unconditional surrender. The work of the fighter pilots and the RAF in Europe was done. Their contribution to the final victory had been no mean effort. A protracted, remorseless fight had been maintained at great cost. Nearly 4,000 pilots of fighter command had been killed. A further 2,000 were injured or taken prisoner. If the price of this sacrifice was freedom, then the fighter pilots epitomized the type of youth who provided a shield, preserving that elusive ideal for future generations. <laughs>